Hello everyone, welcome to our Egyptian online seminar group. First, keep your microphones off. Then if you have any questions, you can ask our speaker during his presentation or after his presentation. I have great pleasure of welcoming Professor Mark Suleiman. Mark uh, Suleiman is one of the top accounting resource leaders in the world. He is a professor of, uh, of accounting at the University of South California. He has held positions at Stanford University and the University of Washington. Professor Suleiman uh, has been published in top ranking journals uh, in accounting, including uh, Journal of Accounting and Economics, uh, Journal of Accounting Research, uh, the, the Accounting Review, the Review of Accounting Studies, Management Science, and Contemporary Accounting Research. He won uh, the uh, notable contribution to the accounting literature, the accounting literature, along with the best paper awarded at several conferences. He is on the editorial board of the Review of Accounting Studies. Now we will start our seminar with Professor Mark Sulem. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Muhammad. Uh, thank you very much for attending the seminar. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, so as you can all see, uh, hopefully the screen is sharing uh, properly. Okay. Um, so the, the paper I wanna talk about today is the pecking order of beating alternative benchmarks. This is a co-authored paper with Adam, Julie and Quan from, uh, uh, from China and Texas A&M. Um, and you know, the motivation for this paper is if you see uh, an article like this. So UAL, which is United Airlines, the parent of United Airlines said today, it expected its first quarter earnings to su surpass the most optimistic forecast. So you can see that the, the media cares that there is, um, that you uh, surpass the most optimistic forecast. So if you think about the forecasts, say someone is covering United Airlines, um, there's, there's 10 different analysts covering United Airlines. And what we always focus on uh, in the literature is just the mean of those 10, for, those 10 forecasts. Um, so the average forecast for this quarter. But then the question is, what about the highest forecast and the lowest forecast? Um, uh, do those have any relevant information? And what we basically say in this paper is that they do have relevant information and that the highest forecast uh, is important and the lowest forecast is important. So managers want to beat the best forecast because that shows that they're doing a very good job. But most importantly, they want to make sure they don't miss the worst forecast, the lowest forecast, because <clears throat> sorry, if it's one thing to miss the lowest it's one thing to miss the average, but it's much, much worse to miss the lowest forecast um, because this shows that you can't even make the forecast of the lowest analyst, the worst, the most pessimistic analyst of your, of your firm. Um, okay, so this is what I just said. So the, uh, the literature has always focused on firms that just meet or beat the median or the mean consensus. Uh, and this is sort of what everyone talks about is the, the average. <coughs> Sorry, my throat is hurting. Um, so, um, but then there's this anecdotal evidence like I just showed you that said, well, maybe the highest and the lowest forecast are also important. Um, and then we also know that, that prospect theory suggests that individuals don't want or keen to avoid losses. So the question is, is there a pecking order? So we know that the consensus forecast is important because you know we've seen that, but then what about the top and the bottom? And then if they're the top and the bottom matter, so that's kind of the first question, which one matters more? Does the, is the top the most important? Is the bottom the most important? Is the middle the most important? So is there kind of an order of importance uh, between, these, um, between these different benchmarks? So this is what we're going to explore in the paper. Um, you know, rational models assume that uh, investors are, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> are adverse to ambiguity. They don't want, they don't want ambiguity. So they may be reacting. So in thinking about this pecking order, 
they may be reacting more cautiously to the good signal than the bad signal, right? So the, the bad signal, people are gonna react very strongly to a bad signal, but a very good signal, they won't react as well, as much, right? Um, and, you know, different papers show that, you know, when you have good news, you need confirmatory evidence. You know, you wanna say, well, let me see if it's really good news before I really react to the good news. Whereas bad news, uh, people react very quickly to bad news. They react immediately to bad news. Um, and if, if managers know all this, right, will they manage earnings around this, this pecking order, right? Will, you know, um, uh, so opportunistic earnings management will not achieve strong results in exceeding the maximum as accruals will likely reverse before the arrival of confirmatory news uh, needed for the full realization. So, you know, what does that mean? That means that if, if you have good news, well, you need to have confirmatory good news, which means I have good news this quarter and next quarter and next quarter and next quarter. Well, if I just do accruals management, then I probably won't, um, I won't have a chance for the, the accruals to last. The accruals will probably reverse before the next piece of good news comes out. So accrual management isn't going to be very effective um, uh, if, if I'm for, for good news, for, for trying to get good news. So if I'm, if I'm trying to manage earnings, I want to really try to avoid the bad news outcome, right? Where I miss the worst, the most pessimistic forecast, right? The, the analyst who thinks the worst of my firm, that's the person I really want to avoid, you know, missing that forecast. And Oh, by the way, if anyone has any questions, just feel free to ask me as I as I go through. So, but so that's the good side. But on the bad side, if you miss the minimum forecast, you can imagine that the stock price will immediately get hit, right? And um, and people, the the investors will react very badly to um, to to this kind of news. So managers know this, right? And they can immediately avoid this price decline by managing accruals. So managing accruals to miss, so that I don't miss the most pessimistic forecast is going to be a very effective tool. Um, through Though inevitable accrual reversal ensures this benefit is temporary, right? Uh, you know, accruals do reverse. The, the managerial myopia literature offers considerable evidence that the managers have an incentive to do this, right? That even though it's not a long-term effect, that managers will still do it because they wanna temporarily prop up the price of the stock. So managers then have strong incentives to manage earnings to avoid missing the minimum than to achieve the maximum, right? So our pecking order is basically saying that the minimum forecast you know, if you miss the minimum, you look really bad and you don't wanna miss the minimum. And because missing the minimum makes you look really bad, there's the most to gain by not missing the minimum. Uh, and then further, managing accruals will work in, 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 in avoiding missing the minimum. Whereas managing a, using accruals won't really work in achieving the maximum, right? So when you achieve the maximum, you look good um, and you know, it, it, there's a, it, it's nice, but it, missing the minimum is really the big one that you want to avoid, right? So this is kind of our pecking theory that the minimum is the big one. And that's the most important one that managers need to not miss. And then they want to beat the consensus and then they want to beat the maximum in that order. So our research questions are, do these alternative benchmarks exist? So that's kind of the first question, right? Is there, is, is, does it matter the, the maximum? We know that the, the, the consensus matters, lots of literature on the consensus, but does the top and the bottom matter? Um, and do managers attempt to beat them? And if so, is there a pecking order <clears throat> in achieving these benchmarks? Are there stronger patterns for one versus the other? And then what if any capital markets exist for obs uh, observing this behavior by management, right? So if managers are trying to do this, um, 
you know, does the capital market reward them, right? And can what capital markets incentives can be anticipated by management for their benchmark beating behavior, right? So if the if the stock market rewards me for beating the benchmarks, then clearly the managers know this and they may try to game the system so that they can beat these benchmarks, right? So these are our three research questions. Those do they exist? Is there an order between them? And how does the stock market react to those, those benchmarks? So I'll give you a quick preview of our, of our results. There's kinks. So we look at some of the Berg, Stoller, Dechev type kinks, and we find that there are kinks and earnings management behavior appear to exist for all three benchmarks. So clearly there's benchmark beating behavior happening. And the minimum forecast seems to be the primary objective of management, then the consensus, then the maximum. And this pecking order is consistently found along the following empirical tests. The kink and likelihood of earnings management is one. The existence of higher incentives is two. And then the consequences of beating the various benchmarks is three. So we find all three things. So here's the first question. Do these benchmarks exist? And so here we have a distribution of, of, the, of the earnings forecasts around the maximum, okay? And as you can see, there's a kink there, right? There's a, a little kink between the just below the line and just above the line, okay? But this is the maximum. These are the, the firms that are trying to beat the best analysts, the highest analysts. And you can see there's a little kink there. And then, oops, then when you go to the consensus, the mean, you find there's a bigger kink for the mean. And then when you get to the minimum, you find the biggest kink, right? And so clearly the, the benchmark beating behavior is even stronger for the minimum, right? So that kink gets bigger and bigger uh, as you go. So what this is showing us is that at least the, the, the distribution is showing that more managers are trying to beat the minimum then, as you can see here, the maximum. Okay. Um, and so we, we look at now, we want to look at earnings management uh, tests. So how are managers doing this? We look at three different approaches. One, the Bergstaller Dechev Dichev kink during distribution. That's the one we just looked at. Then we look at discretionary accruals and we look at the discretionary accrual model, the performance matching discretionary accruals. And then finally, we look at non-GAAP earnings. So maybe managers are using the definition of GAAP earnings or non-GAAP earnings in order to beat the, um, the minimum, the, the minimum, the maximum, and the consensus. So we look at all three. So that you know, we, we you know, from this picture, we see that something is happening, right? Clearly, they're they're doing it. So now we're going to try to figure out how they're doing. It. So the first question, we'll just get right to the tests. Um, the first question is, uh, do, do these things exist? So if you look at the minimum, you find that there is a significant discretionary accruals um, around the minimum forecast. Uh, and you find uh, even after, so in the first column, you find it's positive and then the second column even after we control for net operating assets, which is a measure of slack. And then finally, we look at positive exclusion use and then across all three, we find strong results for the minimum. So clearly there's something happening on the minimum side, right? Discretionary accruals are high and positive exclusions are high. And then the mean, we find the same thing. We find that discretionary accruals are there and that the positive exclusion use is there. But on the max, we find we find discretionary accrual use, but we don't find positive exclusion use, right? Which is it actually goes in the opposite direction. So, um, are they are are they do they appear to be using they appear to be using discretionary accruals for all three, uh, but positive exclusion use for only two of the three. Okay, so clearly managers are doing something to try to exceed the benchmark. And then the question, now the second question is, is there a pecking order, right? Which one is stronger? And here, if you look across the accruals, you find that the 
it's much stronger for the minimum, right? You can see it's 0 0.2002, and then it's half of that, 0, 0, 001, and then even less for max. They're all significant, okay? But the strongest discretionary accruals are found in the minimum scenario, and then mean, and then max, right? So it's clear from this that, that um, there's more discretionary accruals for the min. So, so managers are trying harder to beat the min than the max. And then if you look at exclusion use, you find a similar pattern. It's very high for the min, less for the mean, and then non-existent basically for the max. It's actually going in the wrong direction uh, for the max. So this, this, this slide is all very consistent. It shows that there is a pecking order that managers are trying harder to beat the minimum forecast than they are trying to beat the consensus and even harder to, than the maximum. Oops. And then we also control for the interaction with NOA, uh, just because NOA is a measure of the, the bloated balance sheet as Barton and Simcoe talked about in 2002. And you can see that even after controlling for the interaction with that and NOA, you find again, similar results. So the pecking order gets, uh, the discretionary calls get less and less uh, as we move along the, 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 the different benchmarks. Now the question is, let's look at accrual reversals. So I would expect that accruals that aren't real are going to reverse. And so if we look across the, the different um, uh, benchmarks, we find that there's very little accrual reversal in the first quarter, but that there's some accrual reversal, uh, the accruals don't reverse in the mean and the max. So again, accrual reversal negative is indication that they're bad accruals, that they're not really legitimate accruals. Okay. And then as you start to move out further, you get a little bit of significance for the, the men. And then you get lots of significance <clears throat> three and four quarters out. So it's basically saying that the minimum forecast, the discretionary pools reverse further out. Um, and, and in three or four quarters, they do actually reverse, indicating that they're not very good at pools, indicating that there's some suspect management behavior. So that's the existence. Now let's talk about the pecking order, right? And uh, you can see that, um, uh, again, the, the, these accruals reverse out quarter two, indicating that they're lower quality. Uh, and then the, the maximum firms do not reverse at all, right? So the discretionary accruals um, seem to be maybe good discretionary accruals, right? So for the maximum, they, they aren't as suspect, they aren't as suspicious as they are for the minimum. And now we look at future ROA, and future ROA is a measure again of earnings management, right? When earnings goes down in the future, that means that in the, in the current period, they're being propped up artificially, and then we see them drop in the future, right? So, you know, looking at the pecking order, you see it very clearly, right? ROA for minimum firms drops a lot, right? So you, know, you have this, you know, firms that just beat, and by the way, suspect min is just beating the min. And you can see that in the next quarter, those earnings drop, right? So it's not a good thing. Whereas you don't see that for suspect max. In fact, it's the opposite. They tend to go up, um, sorry. And you find that for quarter two, three, and four as well, the same pattern exists. Uh, for all, all the future quarters and all of it is consistent across the different uh, time periods that we have picked. Um, so then the third question, uh, I'm actually, it looks like I'm going to end early. <laughs> I'm, I'm going very fast. Does anybody have any questions? Feel free to ask me. Um, and so what we look at now is what about the capital markets effect incentives, right? What are those incentives like? And uh, we look at CAR, that's a three-day, <coughs> excuse me, cumulative abnormal return around the announcement date. 
And then we look at MBE, which is a, a earnings meter beat indicator. And then unexpected earnings UE is the surprise. So we, we try to capture surprise. Um, and we estimate it within a very narrow band. So if you look at um, the different uh, abnormal returns, you find that for the minimum, it's, point, it's 0.79. For the mean, it's 6.8, and then it drops to 4.2. Okay, what does that mean? That means when, when you beat the, the consensus forecast, the, the, min, the mean, it goes up 6.8. But if you beat the minimum, it goes up even higher. Right, so beating the minimum is really, really rewarded by companies, uh, by by investors. Sorry, and beating the maximum, it also goes up, but not nearly as much. Almost half of what it goes up to beating the minimum. So beating the the, the minimum doubles the stock market return than beating the maximum. So clearly, the stock market really wants you to beat the minimum, right? And they really reward you for beating the minimum but they don't really reward you for beating the maximum. And of course, this is consistent with what we talked about earlier, where beating the maximum requires confirmatory good news in the future, whereas beating the minimum market participants react immediately. And here we're looking at the, some of the PED results in the literature. So maybe PED, you know, the post earnings announcement drift in the prior literature that shows that um, the, the firms that beat the highest uh, return, the, 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 uh, the highest earnings surprise tend to do better. And the firms that do the highest lows, the, low, the, the, miss, uh, the lowest do worse. So if you look here at the bottom, you find that the full PED results are 5.6%, uh, but the results for the min max, which is just our test is 6.2. It's actually greater versus the non. Right. So what this is basically saying is that the post earnings announcement drift that the prior literature has found may actually be a result of this min max effect, um, as opposed to just the highest and the lowest decile, which is the way the stock market kind of operation is this. And then another way we want to look at this is sort of is there a benefit to beating the min or the maximum so jennings et al have a paper about relative rankings and what they basically find is that um, where you are in the ranking of 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 other firms other firms in the industry is very very important and um and so what we look at here are the future rankings. Okay, so if you look at this very first column, you find that the rankings really go uh, down um, if you if you miss if you if you miss the min. Okay, so missing the min. Um, so there's MBE you know, beating the max and missing the min. When you miss the min, it it really it really drops a lot. Whereas when you beat the max, it really goes up a lot, right? Um, and so this, this relative performance ranking is very important to firms because they want to appear that they're doing well relative to their peers. Um, and so missing the min hurts that uh, in, the, in, in not only the, you know, the first uh, quarter, but in all of the quarters, as you can see, uh, as you can see there. And then it goes up for all of the quarters, uh, as you can see uh, right there. Does anybody have any uh, questions or? Mark, I do have a quick question, if that's OK. Sure. OK, um, so how do management forecasts work into this? So in terms of management kind of updating analysts right, with, with better information, particularly regarding the minimum, I would imagine there may be some talking down behavior that might happen before kind of an extreme event. And I haven't read the paper or anything, but I just wonder if you could speak to that and say how that kind of fits in with all of this. That's a, that's a great uh, comment, Kyle. I mean, we haven't looked at it um, and I wouldn't be surprised that that'd be a great follow-up paper. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if management if, if management forecasts were there to kind of offset 
some of these consequences. So um, you could interact it somehow with, you know, I missed the analyst minimum, but I made my own forecast, right? So I'm trying to mitigate what's going on. Um, and of course, there could be communication between the analysts and management. Management could be trying to communicate with analysts saying, um, look, you know, uh, your, your forecast is too low or whatever the case may be. So there could be some back and forth uh, interactions. I wouldn't, that wouldn't surprise me at all. But as far as us looking at management, we, we haven't looked at management forecasts at all uh, in this paper, but that's, that'd be a great follow-up idea. Awesome, thanks, awesome. appreciate it, Mark. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I feel bad. I'm I'm ending extremely early, and I didn't realize I I needed more slides. I actually thought I had too many slides, but um, anyone else? Any other questions? Hey, Mark. Uh, my yes. name is Bright. Uh, to follow up on uh, Kyle, is that Kyle's question? Uh, yeah. I think it might be interesting to look at management's. Uh, earnings forecast the range because there's some research showing that the maximum in the range is management's true uh, forecast. It might be interesting to compare it to the uh, minimum and the maximum of analysts' um, forecast. That's a that's a really good idea. I mean, I didn't realize that. So when <coughs> sorry when when managers issue uh, a range forecast. Uh, I hadn't seen this paper. So they're basically, the paper contends that the maximum forecast in that range is what manage, management really thinks. Yeah, there's some, <laughs> there's some work uh, on that. That's mm. what I heard. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's super interesting. Yeah, and then yeah, I, go ahead. No, I, I would love to see how those interact. I mean, um, maybe you and Kyle should get together and write a paper, but uh, you know, uh, it, that'd be very interesting because, you know, um, it, I don't think it works that way with analysts, right? But then watching the overlap between the analyst range and the manager's range and comparing mins and maxes there, and then kind of seeing what happens ex post, right? You know, how do these ranges actually manifest themselves? I think that'd be super interesting. Mm. Thank you. Um, and another question is, um, I find the finding very interesting. Um, do you have a sense of uh, what kind of earnings accrual is the management doing for managing, for beating the minimum? Because I would imagine they would want to use the accrual that reverses um, very slowly in the future, right? To prevent investors from seeing through their tactic. Yeah, I mean, it's it's difficult with discretionary accruals to <clears throat> pin it down to a particular accrual. We, we didn't do any work like that. We just used the, you know, the Jones model performance matching, you know, the standard uh, discretionary accrual models. And it's very difficult to figure out which accrual is doing all the, the work. But yeah, it would be smart to, uh, to find one that reverses slowly uh, so that you can get away with it a little bit longer. Um, mm -hmm. And we do find that it takes a, a couple of quarters for it to come out. So um, so they're doing something, but clearly the incentives exist. I mean, the market really reacts when you beat the minimum, much more than, than the consensus and more than the max. So, and it's really all in that order. So uh, it's, the results are really, you know, great that they all lined up the way they did. I mean, it's, uh, you know, every way we looked at it, it was always min, consensus, and max. And that's not even how we started the paper. But then we just saw that everything resulted that way. And we're like, oh, that's what's going on here, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, I find that very interesting as well. And I kept wondering how come the market did not see through the tactics uh, for beating the minimum? Yeah. I mean, like, look. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, I was just wondering how come they didn't see through that by looking at the reversals. Yeah, I mean, this is the age old question, right? Of all earnings management literature, right? Every time you find earnings management, someone says, well, if you can find it, 
and you're a researcher, why can't the market see it? Why can't the market unwind it? And, you know, I mean, it's, it's difficult to, to know why, right? Because, but after the fact, it's easy for us to go back and, and you know, aggregate and, and test and, you know, but like during earnings season, there's thousands of companies announcing earnings, right? And, and you, know, you know, IBM announces that they beat, you know, and the market goes up, you know, and, and in our abnormal return test, we look at it for a day or two like one day before and one day after um and does it uh does it beat you know and and what happens five days later ten days later well i mean i don't know but what we find in the peed results is that basically that decline then happens um you know but it takes longer than the than the short-term results yeah so interesting stuff thank you mm -hmm. Very good. Any other questions? Okay. Um, all right. So my conclusion slide, I apologize for the short seminar. Um, uh, so managers appear to act more opportunistically around the minimum. Um, and what they what they're trying to do is create a pooling equilibrium so they're trying to blend in with everybody else and say hey yeah we beat the minimum and we're just like you know you know others whereas with the maximum it almost some of the evidence indicates <clears throat> that they're trying to create a separating equilibrium they're trying to say we're different than everyone else <clears throat> we have another paper in management science talking about um, positive extreme earning surprises. And we look at these very high earning surprises. Um, and what they're basically trying to do in those, in that, in that setting is, is to try to set themselves apart and really, you know, you know, go and show that they're different than the other companies. And, you know, th these findings really fill a void in academic research. I mean, every paper you look at on benchmark meeting is about the consensus. You know, it's like, you know, 300 papers on beating the benchmark, the consensus benchmark, right? And what we're basically introducing here is another benchmark to the literature. We're saying, well, it isn't just the consensus. Maybe there's other benchmarks that we should be looking at. And one of them appears to be the minimum. That appears to even be stronger than the consensus benchmark. And, uh, and we're offering here a very consistent explanation with observations in the popular press. Uh, as well as releases by managers frequently highlighting and discussing that they beat these benchmarks and they talk about it, right? Like, hey, we beat the maximum forecast. We're really good, you know, and they, they make, they go out of their way to tout <clears throat> that they beat the maximum forecast. They want to point that out, that we didn't just beat the, you know, the consensus, we beat everybody. And on the other side, you know, when you look at headlines of when a firm misses the worst forecast, they don't talk about it, but the mar the investors do. And the investors say, you know, IBM missed the most pessimistic forecast, you know, and they let, and everyone looks at it and, and talks about it, right? That you didn't, you couldn't even make the worst forecast. And so that will be highlighted uh, by investors. And as you can see, uh, punished by investors as well um, for, for missing uh, the, uh, the minimum forecast. So, uh, you know, it's a very interesting finding that the, these benchmarks have, you know, there's different levels uh, and that the minimum is, is a really a key benchmark. Um, so if, if uh, you know, there's, there's no other uh, questions, I thank you. Thank you very much. A, yeah. I have another question. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Brian. Um, so when will management know analysts forecast? When do they learn about the minimum? I mean, it, it takes, the, the, the forecasts are out, I mean, for even a year in advance. Um, I mean, right now, if I go to Google Finance, I can look and see what the, what the forecast is uh, for next year's IBM, you know? Uh, and I can see the distribution, I can see all the analysts. So those numbers are well known in advance. Oh, okay. Just for my knowledge, um, and do analysts change their, forecast like once that's initially released and management can see 
um, do they further revise it? So does the minimum maximum changes? It can, uh, and we actually go to great lengths to make sure that the forecast we're looking at is not a stale forecast, because if it's old and you beat uh, the minimum, but that's because you, know, you, you got one from six months ago that hasn't been changed, then it's a problem. So we, in our paper, we, we make sure that stale forecasts are, are removed um, as well. But yeah, they do change, but we go right up to the most recent change, like a few weeks before. Mm, okay. So when do you expect management start doing the earnings management? I mean, you know, you, you get to the end of the quarter and then you start to, you know, I mean, you, you know what's going to happen, you know, probably a few weeks before, um, you know, maybe even a month or so before. I mean, if you know you're having a bad quarter, you know you're having a bad quarter. So it all depends on how far off you are and what industry you're in and, and which levers you can kind of pull to change things. So I'm sure each company will do it differently. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, are there another questions? If anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Yes. Hey, Mark. Uh, this is uh, this is Henry. Hey, Henry. How's it going? Uh, interesting yeah. paper. I, I was just wondering. Um, so there, there, like, there's a. I think the theory behind what you're what you're saying makes sense. Like the psychological theory of trying to be maxima or trying to avoid missing minima. But um, are, are you concerned at all that? the max and min are serving as statistics for other properties of the distribution of forecasts. So like if it was uniform, then, then the max and min would be sufficient statistics for the, the whole distribution, for instance. Yeah, I mean, but like what, what that, that's probably true. I mean, the max and min are, are representing something else, but like, what, what do you, what, what do you think we should, what, what do you think we should be concerned about? Like, that there well, I, I, I guess I, I probably, I was in and out, unfortunately, but um, like, a, I guess I wasn't sure how something like, uh, like forecast dispersion was affecting what you were looking at. Or like the, also like the max and min are sort of mechanically going to be larger when there's more forecasters. Uh, oh, so yeah, yeah. Just I mean, things like I, that I, that would affect the distribution might, might be good to yeah, that's, that's, uh, I mean, the, the standard deviation, I think at some point we control for, and, and we have a few things in there, like, you know, you have to have more than like four or five forecasts. I mean, if you have two forecasts, then obviously one's the max and one's the min and it's stupid. Um, so I think we, 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 you know, we, we insist on like five or six and there's some minimum dispersion level, like to avoid this uniform uh, situation you're talking about. Um, so we, we do have a few, like we run some, and so we end up with bigger companies, right? That have more analysts following them, but otherwise this min max thing doesn't really work very well if it's just a few, few analysts. Um, right. So we, yeah. So we try to get around some of that stuff. I mean, those are good points. And, and then one other sort of, hopefully not too nitpicky question, but do you, when using um, the IBIS data or using the the detail file or the min and max reported in the summary file? No, I think it's a detailed file. Okay, so are, are there issues of like, at least the academic IBIS database not reporting all of the, the forecasts? I, I, it sort of seems like that would bias against finding anything, but I, I think they, they talk about like, well, at least in the summary, for the summary file, they talk about dropping outliers I don't know if they drop outliers from the detail file or how they choose what to include or exclude above and beyond banks that say they don't want to be, or you know, firms that say they don't want their forecast to be included. Yeah, I mean that's a good question. I mean, like, like you point out, like if it's if if the if the if the, if the data is bad, it's obviously I think it's going to bias against us um, because if the min and the max that's being reported isn't actually the min and the max, then we're not really testing the right thing. Um, but, you know, having said that, I think, you know, just like all researchers who are at the whim of, of IBIS on this one. Um, and, uh, to, you know, to the degree that there's something that will create the results, I think we're more concerned. But, you know, this one I'm, I'm less concerned about, like you said, just because of 
you know, it's just noise. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks a lot. Series. Yeah, good seeing you, Henry. Likewise. Yeah, are there another question? If anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. If anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Uh, thank you very much, dear Professor Mark Solomon, uh, for your contribution and your effort. Uh, it's really an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, and that's all that remains for me uh, to say is the thank you everyone that's joined us. And I thank you very much for taking the time. I want to present it to us today, dear Professor Mark. It's been really appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for everyone for coming.